yeah, I, I love hacking APIs. APIs are my favorite things to hack because they are so vulnerable. Oh yeah, 100%. I really do like, genuinely recommend it as a great place to start for beginners, primarily because it's more about how much time you invest and less about the technical know-how. And this might seem, okay, this is like a fake API. Again, this is genuinely like how I hack. I actually have a script that tests this automatically on real clients. So I don't even have to do the work of typing in roles. And I can see here it's returning all of the roles. And this is such a common issue. It's often called like broken access control, but genuinely some of the vulnerabilities that I've been paid like one to five grand for have been as simple as this. Wow. Like these are not technical vulnerabilities. They just take a lot of time because, you know, you'd have to brainstorm a lot of words to do with university and school, and you'd have to try a lot of different things. But I tell you what, beginners have more than anything else time, enthusiasm, passion, and we'll have a go. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very, very special guest, Katie Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, really looking forward to this. So uh, before we get started, I just want to say this, make sure that you go and subscribe to Katie's YouTube channel, Katie has fantastic content on her YouTube channel. Go and follow her on Twitter. And Katie, we were talking offline. Where on your channel do you recommend that people start? Can you show us like where to start on your channel? I believe you've got like a playlist that we can that we can look at. Yes. If anyone is interested in getting into hacking and you basically have no idea where to start, I fully recommend my new to bug hunting. Now that's what I call bug bounty. 2020 it goes through step by step like how to get started some common issues that people have um, how to use some of the tools we use and it's all designed for beginners there is also everything api hacking which has basically all the content i've ever made on hacking apis which is what we're going to do today i'll just say this um if you i've looked at some of your videos you've got amazing content there so for everyone who's watching if you you know, don't get what you need from my channel or this specific video. Go and have a look there. Katie does a fantastic job uh, with Bug Bounty, but APIs as well. And that's, you know, the focus of this video. You are going to show us how to hack a university and change your grades. And I mean, disclaimer, this is a test university, not a real university, right? Yeah. So I actually work for a real university. <laughs> and obviously my <laughs> students love the idea of hacking the university. Of so course. induction week, when I'm teaching them, I'm like, do not touch the university. So instead I like redirect them to a generic university. And and this is, this is something that people can get from GitHub, right? Yes, this is completely available. Somebody was very kindly put it on Docker as well. So there are so many different ways. You can just Google generic university. It is like the top result on Google, which is probably one of my most proudest moments. So just for everyone watching, once again, I'll put links below to Katie's Twitter, to YouTube. Uh, I'll put links to GitHub. But Katie, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, keep you any longer. Do you want to take us through what you're going to demo? I believe you're going to show some of the OWASP top 10 stuff because this is what this this is about, right? Yeah. So generic university is a nice university. Um, <laughs> Until you hack it. Kind, you've been kind of wandering around, um, doing a bit of reconnaissance, and you've come across uh, this web page. And this is a kind of feature that's a work in progress. It's like a view your grade system. It's under construction. You know, Brandon and IT is still working on it. <laughs> uh, though he does have the ability for you to report a security vulnerability. If we open it up in Burp Suite here, now Burp Suite is a fantastic tool for web pen testers. It is basically like the tool that everybody uses. Um, so we've got a lot of very large amount of tabs. We're gonna be primarily focusing today on the target tab and the repeater tab. So in our target, if we kind of see here, we can see like every endpoint this is hitting from like the login page to the vulnerability page to probably the most exciting part, which is the API. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that's gonna be the focus of this video, right? You, and I'll just, I'll just say this, yes. you've done a lot of work recently on APIs. It's sort yeah. of like a like a focus of yours recently, is that right? Yeah, I, I love hacking APIs. APIs are my favorite things to hack because they are so vulnerable. They are <laughs> they <laughs> are just full of security flaws and it kind of makes sense. Like there's quite easy to miss them because when you've got a developer yeah. that's developing a huge API that might have, you know, like 
thousands of different ways of using it that might be for developers or it might be for regular users or it integrates with an app it very quickly gets kind of out of hand and you just lose track of like where your security is but that's great for me as a hacker because i pick (laughs) them up and i get paid and i love that yeah i mean i was was listening to one of the other interviews where you're talking about like your first bug you 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 got to give us like just give us like the thirty second overview. You were like in a competition, is that right? And you found it straight away or something. It was an amazing story. Yeah, so I I'd never done any hacking before, like ever. I actually had rejected doing any hacking because I was like, that sounds way too difficult for me. I am not that clever. Um, right. And I went. Say someone to, with uh, a PhD, right? Yeah. Yeah. I I like I was like I'm good at some things, but hacking is not one of them. And I was really fortunate. But my friends bullied me into it. They were like, hey, Katie, you should come to this. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really good at <laughs> hacking. And they just bullied me into it. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll go. And when I was there, I was hacking on Uber. I got my first bug, got my second bug, got paid like my first bounty. I got paid $1,000, got invited to go to Vegas, found two more vulnerabilities in Vegas, was like, Get, getting these like crazy bounties and hanging out with some of the best hackers in the world. And I realized I might actually be good at this. This may not be like the hardest thing. Like I think it is. It might actually be, you know, something that I could do. I wanted to ask you about that because I, you, you say you're really excited about APIs and it's, it sounds like if someone's new to hacking and, and they had like that, have that nervousness, perhaps like you had in the past, APIs is a great place to start. Is that correct? Yeah, hundred percent. It doesn't require technical skill. It just requires time. Like you need to invest a lot of time into like understanding an API and how it's supposed to work and kind of how it could be broken and what the client really cares about. So they're great places to start because as long as you are super (laughs) obnoxious and just keep on going, you can actually find a bug eventually. Like by far one of the, my favorite, my favorite things to hack. So if I'm new to sort of bug bounty, I'm new to like hacking in 2022 this is a this is I'm, I'm i'm assuming based on what you've said this is a great place to start oh yeah 100 percent. i really do like genuinely recommend it as a great place to start for beginners primarily because it's more about how much time you invest and less about the technical know-how and obviously as you get more experienced it becomes a lot easier i've found bugs in literally like five minutes it's crazy i was oh, wow. surprised when that happened if you're just starting out you invest like an hour of time you kind of get a pretty good Uh, return on your time investment. So it's by far the biggest thing I recommend starting with. That's brilliant. And the software you're using, that's Community Edition, right? A book. Yes, completely free. You can download it. That's great. Sorry, I didn't want to, I took you on a tangent there. Sorry. No, it's all good. But yeah, so this is Burp. It's got a lot of features. I'm going to ignore most of them because API hacking is about just trying everything and seeing if it works. It's about hitting your head against a brick wall and eventually getting through it. So I'm just going to click on this and say send to repeater and what repeater does is repeat a request so it repeats what we've sent it so we can send it again so, so sorry I just want to i just want to ask the, the, the sort of the yeah. beginner question sorry katie so you opened the university web page in a browser while you yeah. had a uh, burp running and that's what we we, we yeah. saw just a second ago right yeah okay. i went here open browser and then i just opened it up in the background and then you and then you captured that that information right okay Yeah, it does it all automatically now. It's quite nice. Great. If I go to repeater and I just press send, it's going to send exactly the same data as I've already sent. So I can see here, it's going to make a request for API users and it's going to make a request for the sixth user. And here I can see I've got some information and this is where Brannon's name is coming up. He's the sixth user. For some reason, the API is getting the sixth user. We can kind of, you know, see how this API is starting to form. Now, one really fun thing about APIs is that once you have an idea of the structure, they become really easy to hack because if you want to get the sixth user, you put a slash six. If you want to get all the users, you simply get rid of the ID press send, and then it will return every (laughs) single user in the database. And I wish I was joking when I said, I've actually found this bug on like real clients, like a surprising amount, do not restrict this. And we'll just send back everything. And you can see here, I've got some lovely test accounts that I've made as well. But we can see, uh, you know, Walter Waters, who's a student. We can see Rosetta, who's a student. And we can kind of don't necessarily know because it does say role ID one and role ID two. So if I'm seeing 
a uh, like some name and then underscore ID. The first thing I'm going to try is replacing this because if I have a user ID and that's six, then I'm going to do API slash users. If I have something called role ID, I'm going to go in here and try roles. And this might seem, okay, this is like a fake API. Again, this is genuinely like how I hack. I actually have a script that tests this automatically on real clients. So I don't even have to do the work of typing in roles. And I can see here it's returning all of the roles. We've got, you know, an ID one wow. admin, ID two student, ID three teacher. And now if I kind of go back to what I had before, I can kind of understand this a bit more. That's a student, that's a student, 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 admin, instructor. The interesting thing about APIs is that I think people often kind of focus too much on the technical things because we see a login here. Now we don't know a user account. But we do know it's slash login. And this is why I really like API hacking in particular, because sometimes it just takes a little leap of logic to go, if login exists, maybe register exists. And then you can, you know, register a new account. I'm going to put in Katie here, type in a lovely fake email address. <laughs> Got to make it password one, two, three, four and register. And now you can see we've got an actual account. Now this is really important for broken object level authorization and broken function level authorization. Once we have an account, we can test privileges beyond our own. So think about like an admin should be able to edit, say what classes somebody is in. A user shouldn't, they should just be able to see what they're in. A instructor should be able to change the grades. A user doesn't. Now we need to figure out, okay, what other APIs are there? And if we want to just kind of brute force this, we can try things like, you know, you know, it's called view your grades. We could try grades, classes, course, university. We can just kind of come up with names. Again, just from our own brain, we're not trying to go through like super complex technical stuff. We're just like, this is a university website. What words are to do with universities? So you might end up with slash grades and uh oh we've got our first error. So this is a 401 er error, and that means unauthorized. So if we scroll down though, it says unauthenticated. Now these are really two different ideas and they're both really important for broken access level authorization and broken function level authorization vulnerabilities. Authenticated refers to whether or not we're logged in. Authorized refers to what permissions we have. So the question we might ask ourselves is, okay, is this actually unauthorized or is this unauthenticated? As in, if we have an account, which we do now, could we now do it? <laughs> and this is such a common issue. Um, it's often called like broken access control, but genuinely some of the vulnerabilities that I've been paid like one to five grand for have been as simple as this. Wow. Like these are not technical vulnerabilities. They just take a lot of time because... You know, you'd have to brainstorm a lot of words to do with university and school, and you'd have to try a lot of different things. But I tell you what, beginners have more than anything else, time, enthusiasm, passion, and will have a go. I love that you, you, you're you taking this back to the real world. And I think that's an important thing. You're doing bug bounty. You're doing this in the real world. I mean, this is a demo site because obviously for YouTube and obviously for the real, you know, for demos like this, we can't use a, a proper site, but it's so nice to hear that, you know, this is actually what you're finding out there. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, this whole generic university comes from real vulnerabilities. I found one of my favorites is for an, a website to do with airplanes. You could change the runway length. As long as you were logged in, you could change the runway length. And this wow. may seem like kind of small. It's like, well, that's only like a single number on a database. But then you realize, hang on, aeroplanes need certain lengths of runway depending on how big they are because big planes can't stop in time. Yep. So if you think about the real world impact of that, you've got a quite a simple vulnerability. You know, you could change something only being logged in without necessarily being authorized to into you could kill like a hundred people because the plane could crash. Very, very unlikely that it would, very unlikely that this would never get noticed. But I always think it's really important to think about the real world impact of things like that because it's really easy to get caught up in like the technical details and not consider, hang on, there's actual real people who are going to be using this system, and they're the ones that really feel the effects of a security vulnerability. So Katie, just want to make this clear. 
the uh, the university website you said is a docker container it's something that i can just download and then run and then i can do this myself right yes so if you go on generic university's github page um it has full setup instructions if you want to set it up or alternatively um you can just use docker and there's also instructions uh created by the very nice person who uh, made that docker container that goes over setting it up and then how to access it but it should be as simple as like a few clicks and you can install it and have a go yourself. Um, but yeah, so we're in Repeater. Now, this is where we see this cookie start to matter. So this is a JSON web token. Doesn't really matter what it means. Um, it's just a way of kind of authorizing who somebody is. Now, this is the one where we haven't been logged in. So if I go back to open up our account and I refresh the page, I can go into proxy, HTTP history. I'm just seeing the history now. And in here, you can see that this cookie has actually now changed. Um, not massively, it's kind of difficult to notice, but the tell is always the EYJ, that means it's a JSON web token. So if I now right click, send to repeater, go back into repeater and change this tab to be slash grades, we can see here that we're getting a little internal server error uh, and we're getting a ton of data back about um, the the API and we can see class must class name must be a valid object or string. Tons of like interesting thing about the code. So now if we do it, we're getting a 200 OK and we can see a bunch of grades. So 100%, 90%, 36%, 40%. And you can see they can correlate those to a user ID. Now this alone would actually be reportable in a bug bounty program. Because a grade would be, you know, quite privileged information, I would usually just report this. But let's do something more interesting. Because like I said, I, I made this specifically to stop my students from hacking the university. <laughs> now, as much as we could do a GET request, if we look at um, like an API, we can actually do things based on CRUD. Now, CRUD stands for CREATE. We can create a new object. Read, we can read an object or read a collection of objects. U, we can update and delete, we can delete a single object. And we've got the read here, like we can read all the grades, we could probably put a slash one and read a singular grade. But again, that's not very interesting because we could update the grade and give ourselves, you know, a slightly better grade. Now, the great thing about RESTful APIs, which is the type of API this is, is that all of this is like standard. So actually it's super easy to turn this from a read into an update. And the only thing, you, I just want to make sure I understand, the only thing you changed was you you created a fake account and then you logged in with that with those details. Yep. And, now, and now you're getting all this back. That's crazy. Yep. Yeah. So again, really common because what they do is they check for you being logged in. They don't necessarily check your permission level. They don't yeah. go, hey, are you a teacher? Should you be able to see this? They may only check that you're logged in or not logged in. And a lot of the time in frameworks, so this was written in Laravel, a lot of the time in frameworks, it actually works out that by default, some of the default code encourages this and you'd have uh -huh. to write kind of ch the checking code automatically. So people just don't do it. And this mainly comes from like developers being short on time. It's not because, you know, they are purposely trying to do this. Um, they have a lot of pressure to get code out the door and into their customers. They have to take shortcuts. And this is a very common shortcut that people then take. I mean, it doesn't help when they've got these sprints the whole time, is it? I mean, like no, every it really two weeks. Doesn't have to release new code. I mean, it's no wonder they make mistakes. Yeah, and often developer productivity is actually measured in lines of code written. Yeah. So if you think about creating a new feature, that might be, you know, a thousand lines of code to get a feature out the door, but securing it may not even add <laughs> any more lines of code. That yeah. may just be like one one line of code and may take even longer than writing, you know, a super complex feature. Yeah, it's no wonder the mistakes happen. Brilliant. But I mean, that's good news for you. You know, as a bug bounty hunter. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But my partner is a developer though. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we have interesting dinner conversations. So getting a grade is really cool. And being able to see them is kind of neat. We don't have the right permission level, but obviously, you know, I didn't make this just so, um, you know, students would be able to read a grade. I'm trying to influence their criminal minds here a little bit. So obviously <laughs> we want to change a grade as well. So if we have a look at the grades here, we can kind of look down and see, you know, there's like 
uh, someone getting 75, someone getting 73, 44, 16. Now, in the UK, a passing grade is 40 at university level. So let's lift up, um, you know, user ID 3's grade here from a 16, so a fail, all the way up to a really great passing grade. So what I'm going to do is just copy exactly the same. So this is just copied from here. And I'm just going to change what I want to change. So I'm going to change that grade from you know 16 to like 89. Add like a nice job. And as a hacker, we love to deface things. You know, Katie was here, 2022. And we can just get rid of the rest of it because we don't want to change those. It's just the created app, the updated app. We kind of don't really want to leave a trace behind that we touched it anyway. So we can just kind of get rid of that. And the only thing I need to change now is tell it the content type. So I'm just going to copy it from here and just put it anywhere up in the headers. And that's just saying, hey, by the way, we've got some JSON. And then all I do is I change this get to a put. And I'm going to change this to be the ID of the grade, which is ID 12. And I'm going to press send. And would you look at that? Now, user ID 3 has gone from a failing grade to a passing grade. And this is how like simple my first vulnerability was that I found in Uber. I wish I was joking when I say that sometimes these tech companies, you think of that, oh, they're full of really clever people and I could never find a vulnerability. Actually, they are full of a lot of people who make mistakes. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to pick up the mistakes. That's exactly right. I mean, it, I mean, Uber is a great example because they were recently hacked by, what was it, 18 year old from the UK, was it? Yes. My favorite, my favorite thing about tech companies is how often they get hacked by teenagers. <laughs> it's really interesting because it, it's the, what makes a hacker so great is having a different way of thinking. Yeah. Because the developers all think in one way and they go, oh, yeah, this is secure. But someone teenager comes along thinking that ever so slightly differently and actually can find security flaws and flaws in like processes that the company didn't even really think of. The guy at Uber like bullied, essentially sent requests for over an hour to log into his account. Who would have thought of that as an as a, you know, method for hacking? Just keep on trying and hope. He eventually says yes out of sheer annoyance. I, I love what you said in the beginning. You know, it's it you it you don't have to be like hugely technical to to understand this stuff. And I mean, what he did there wasn't hugely technical. It was just irritating someone until they uh, you know, he bypassed two FA. It's um it's amazing. Go on, sorry. That's what I really love about hacking. You know, there's a lot of really technical stuff, and I love technical things. Like I used to be a developer, so I do follow the technical things. But a lot of people, and I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that you have to be like a super technical genius to do this. You really don't. Like simply thinking a little bit differently is such a huge advantage. And especially from, you know, people in groups who aren't necessarily already working in tech. Like I say for myself as, you know, a uh, woman in tech. You know, there's not a lot of people that look like me, which means there's not a lot of people that think like me. And I'm bringing something unique there that they don't necessarily have access to. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, I always like say that my wife is so different to me. Um, she she reads things totally different and she sees solutions that I would never see. So it's great, you know, to have, like you said, I mean, you work with teenagers because you're at university. So, or well, young people, I, younger than me, because I'm a boomer. Um, they must think very differently, say, to, to say your typical tech guy or Oh yeah, whatever. 100%. I, I'm always surprised with how my students think. But it's like, I think a lot of people are like, ha Zoomers are going to be like just memeing. And they're not just memeing. They actually have like really intelligent kind of really thoughtful ways of thinking that I didn't even think about. And I love, I, I use my mom as a bit of a code duck and my mom terrified of computers, like genuinely <laughs> cannot use a phone, cannot use a computer, got scared because she accidentally hit the start menu button on her laptop and short she'd broken the computer. Oh no. Very, very, like not very technically advanced. But you know what? I call her just to kind of... <laughs> see how her brain thinks because it's always really interesting i actually taught her how to hack in a youtube video so my mom does oh, actually wow. know how to hack she'll now like call me up and she'll be like katie there's a great radio show on radio four about hacking and she'll like start talking to me about data breaches and it's like it's like that meme where it's like i made this you made this i made this but it's like i'm i'm a hacker and my mom's like i'm a hacker too now
That's hilarious. I love it. I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's an encouragement because the, as you just said, the developers are so busy with deadlines and they, they're used to thinking a certain way. It's great to have like, people testing their APIs. And I think it's an encouragement for anyone who wants to start or who's new to the industry. It doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter you know, if you're young or old or whatever, you know, get in and try and APIs are a great way to start. So that's brilliant. Yeah, Thanks for demonstrating this. No, I'm I'm happy to be here. And this is, you know, this is not the only API flaw, and not the only API flaw in generic university. There are so many different types of API security vulnerabilities, and you know, some of them are going to be more technical. Some of them are going to require like a ton of research. But actually, quite a lot of them just require somebody who's willing to say, "I'm going to try every single API endpoint and see whether or not." it's vulnerable to this kind of attack. And people make like their entire full-time incomes on that. Katie, you have a PhD, is that right? I do. And what was what is that in? So my PhD is actually like my background. So before I got into cybersecurity, um, I was actually into machine learning. So my, my PhD is actually in machine learning. I completely switched during my PhD from like machine learning to cybersecurity because I realized that I liked machine learning, but actually I really enjoyed offensive security and I really like to play the kind of bad guy, if you will. I mean, I told somebody <laughs> once that I've always wanted to be Sherlock and they were like, but aren't you now Moriarty? And I was like, I'm personally offended by that. That's really mean, but yes. <laughs> I love that. So, I mean, the, I've had this question many, many times and, I'm, and it, it's fantastic to have you, you know, talk about it. Will machine learning or will AI take away our jobs uh, in cybersecurity or, you know, where do you see the trends? Where do you see it going with the, the sort of rising of AI? I think a lot of people are really quick to like push AI solutions to every single problem. But actually, a lot of the kind of issues in cybersecurity, one, are like communication based. So when we tell developers that their code is broken, you know, we can talk about that in a really neutral way and be like, hey, by the way, this code has a vulnerability in it. But for yeah. a developer who might have spent months working on this project, who kind of has spent quite a lot of time in it, that can actually be really difficult for them to hear. And it's really imagine, important yeah. to have a level of empathy towards yeah. them. So that's one thing. It's all well and good to get like a report, but that can make people feel really bad. And also it can make people feel like they're going to lose their jobs. Because it's like, how dare you write insecure code when actually writing insecure code, it happens, right? Like security flaws are going to happen. It's going to be a problem. That's the reason why you have hackers to like stop them from getting out of hand, not necessarily like as a cure for security flaws. The other thing is it requires a lot of creativity. A lot of people say, oh, can't you teach like AI to hack? And you can't because the amount of creativity and like human thinking, at the end of the day, APIs are designed for computers, but they're created by humans, which means humans make design decisions which can impact how an API functions and therefore the types of security vulnerabilities. So given the communication aspect and the empathy mixed with the like, the fact that you need creativity means that it's actually really hard to find a machine learning solution. And I don't okay. think I've yeah. seen a good one yet. So you don't think, I, I mean, and there's a lot of hype of AI versus ML. So you, in, in reality today, versus, I mean, forget about the movies, you know, we, we, I think we all have this picture of the movies, you know, Arnold, the robots are taking over. You don't think that's near term, it's still very much human no. based. Yeah. I think it's going to be very human based, especially in cybersecurity. So at the end of the day, it's really hard to just automate this, let alone adding another layer. And actually machine learning does have like quite a lot of other issues. You need somebody ex who's an expert, one in machine learning, but two in whatever you're trying to automate with it. Like you need somebody like me who has like a machine learning background and a cybersecurity background, and you need data and you need statistics and you, and it's just you get to a point where it's like, okay, these requirements are going to be very hard to meet. And do you see that both for offensive and defensive? Is it, is it, do you feel the same about both? Or do you think AI has a place in like defending companies? I think AI does have a place, but it's about supporting what people are already doing. It's about giving them the tools, say, for example, highlighting suspicious activity, not making this a decision, not saying, hey, this is suspicious, but saying, hey, this activity looks weird. What do you think? about really like supporting 
people working and supporting their intuition and their problem solving, giving them more tools to do their job well. I think at the moment we see a lot of people selling hype and selling, yeah, ours got machine learning, our solution is the best, our solution is this much better than our competitors. Actually, I think it's about tools that kind of bring um, or make people's jobs easier. I love that. I mean, I, I, I'm really glad you said that because, you know, a lot of younger people who watch my videos, um, I don't mean just younger people, but often it is, it's like, okay, I want to get into cyber or I want to make a career change. Um, is it is it worth it? Uh, we, you know, let, let's say, so you give me advice. I'll, I'll take, them, take on that role. I'm, let's say, 18 or I don't have to be that young. I could be older, but I want to get into cyber, but I'm concerned that there's you know, there's no future in this. It, would you recommend that as a career? I'm assuming you would because, you know, you change from dev to this. Um, yes, I do. And I think that there's a lot of careers people don't really think about. People think of cybersecurity yeah. as just hacking. I'm guilty of yeah. that. I'm guilty of seeing <laughs> cybersecurity as just my hacking. But actually, cyber is really broad. Like, yeah. in general, you have people who do more social engineering, you have policymakers, you have, you know, developer and security advocates within development teams, you have, you know, defense teams, offense teams, you have people who work in, like, research versus more hands-on. Actually, it's really, really broad. And there's a lot of different places you can take, you know, an interest in cybersecurity to a career. I always, always say the only thing you need to get a job in cybersecurity is passion for it and genuine interest. I think if you go into cybersecurity because you are really interested in it, that's great. That's fantastic. You'll go far no matter what exact path you take. The Let's say I want to do what you're doing. So talk to me as like someone who's at the beginning of the journey. You you know, when I look at you, it's you've got a PhD, you've got all this development background, you like this amazing, like some would say, like on a pedestal type person, but I let's say I haven't got those kind of skills. Do you have sort of like a roadmap or, or like an idea of where, where would I start? Like, I don't know where to start. You know, would you like, would, should I go do bug bounty? And, you know, wh wh what would you advise me? And assuming like you were back, you were younger again and you were starting out what would you advise someone like me or like your younger self to do well that's such a good question i think if i was advising my younger self i probably i probably advise them to do something different i think if i was talking to my younger self i'd tell her that um just follow every opportunity you get don't just leave an opportunity hanging with a company if somebody wants to follow in kind of what I'm doing, the biggest thing you can do is absorb information. Like be an information sponge, YouTube, blog posts, news articles, podcasts, just consume it, take notes, really make sure that you are kind of, you know, if you want to learn a language, you you will immerse yourself in that language, right? Maybe you live there, maybe you'll listen to music in that language, maybe you'll watch YouTube in that language, whatever. Maybe we'll play games in that language. Do the same for cybersecurity. Put on, you know, your headphones and just, you know, absorb yourself in the language of cybersecurity. See what people are talking about. See what really makes you interested. Because just because I'm interested in it doesn't mean you will be. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this is the ultimate path to get into cybersecurity. But it does mean that you can kind of tailor it based on what you what you're passionate about, what you find interesting, and what really like, you know, sparks joy for you. So I think number one is really immerse yourself in cybersecurity, whether or not that's bug bounty, it doesn't necessarily matter. Just really immerse yourself in that world. And, you know, join us on Twitter, be part of the community. We actually have a really nice community. I will say, I think a lot of people have this impression that the cybersecurity community is really unfriendly. But in my experience, I actually felt really welcome into this community. Like, and I know not everyone will go do a PhD and I don't recommend doing a PhD for everyone. But <laughs> a lot of the skills I learned during my PhD about like doing research and really immersing myself in something has really helped me on this journey, even if the actual like piece of paper didn't. I love that. I mean, I, I think it's exactly that, you know, make contact. And I think that's what's great about like the world today. You can go onto the internet, you can go to YouTube. There's a lot of channels that you can follow. There's a lot of great information on Twitter, like follow you on Twitter and then just see who you follow. And, and you know, go down that rabbit hole of, you know, the people in the industry. And I think you got to find your niche, don't you? It's so yeah. vast. You got to find what you enjoy. Um, Katie, could you show us your YouTube channel again? Because let's say I'm interested in Bug Bounty. Do you have you have a playlist on Bug Bounty as well, don't you? I do. Uh, so this is my YouTube channel. Um, 
this is new to bug hunting start here that is kind of like my greatest hits now that's what i call bug bounty it's designed to kind of be you watch one video after another um and each one kind of builds on the previous ones i've also got everything api hacking so if you're really interested in api hacking that's a great video to start with a great series and i've also got introduction to burp suite as well that goes over the very basics of using it all the way up to like advanced uses. I've got a ton of videos on like all kinds of of topics, uh, including note taking and like professional skills and things like careers. Katie, before we wrap up, do you have a API playlist where you go into like more detail? You know, if, if someone's interested in learning more, is is there more details on your on your YouTube? And I think you've said already, but can you point us to a playlist and tell us kind of what it covers? Yes. So I have everything API hacking, which is basically all my content across, you know, when I've been guests on shows as well of API hacking, it's like several hours long. And if you really want to immerse yourself in API hacking, I really recommend it. I go over uh, how to do reconnaissance, tooling, how to get started with mobile APIs, demonstrations, some um, times I made real cash with vulnerabilities, some tips, some different types of API content. There's a ton of really useful stuff in there if you just want to do everything API hacking. That's brilliant. So I'll put that below. Um, do you have any other resources, perhaps books or other you know people in the industry that you'd recommend that you know, someone follows or books that they read if they're interested in API hacking? Yes. Yeah, so my number one piece of advice is security creators um, dot video. This is a bunch of me and my friends who make videos on YouTube or that stream. And if you don't really like my content for whatever reason, there is definitely somebody else here whose content might vibe with the way you learn more. Mine is very much like watching like a little little lecture like Bug Bounty University. But there is some great content made by friends of mine um that is huge there's an api security book that came out on api hacking it's just called api hacking uh by corey Ball. that's just one of corey yeah yep, yeah corey yes there's that book and there is also practical iot hacking which has an entire chapter on apis and that's also super helpful the oos top 10 again like the whole like oos api security top 10 the discussion there as well super super useful resources katie thanks so much for sharing and thanks so much for creating this university project uh, i'm hoping that it's uh, it stopped your university getting hacked and you know students uh, attention is diverted to sort of this uh, fake university yes i i hope so too i'm hoping it just let them have their little criminal criminal minds be i say that but like every single year i like what do i what do you want to learn about about this year and they're like i want to learn how to hack the university because i think that's going to annoy you <laughs> katie i love it i love my students they are they are great and i i gotta say the the kind of rapport is really good there but yes thank you very much for having me it's been great to sit here and show you generic university and actually how you can get in i really hope that i've inspired some of the viewers watching to actually have a go at hacking yourself because i really do think you know my two pieces of advice is one, hacking is not as hard as you think. And two, hacking is not as easy as you think. It's somewhere in the middle, but that means it's totally achievable. If you're interested in this, please have a go. Uh, get involved. You can at me on Twitter with questions and I'll happily answer some. <laughs> some, I love that. Yeah, please don't please don't flood Katie with too many questions. Uh, please go and subscribe to her YouTube channel below. She's trying to grow her YouTube audience. So please go and subscribe, show, show some love. Go and follow her on Twitter. Katie, again, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great.